together in the gift of this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The disciple of Moses, Joshua, today, and the disciple of Jesus, John, today, are both bent out of shape. And the reason for it is that both Moses and Jesus are way too good. We begin every Mass by recalling the fact that, that we are called to enter into that grace, into that goodness. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At that time, the disciple John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of our company and doesn't follow us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him or stop him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is with us. Anyone who gives a a cup of cold water to one of you because you belong to the Christ, well, amen, I say to you, they will surely not be lost for their reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, well, It would be better for them if a great millstone were put around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into into life maimed than with two hands and go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than to go with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if our eye, your eye, causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna where the worm dies not and the fire is never quenched. The good news of the Lord. Praise to you. You may be seated. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Don't take that literally. Yeah. The last guy to take that literally was the ancient theologian Origen who entered the heavenly choir singing soprano. You don't want to do that. (laughs) And, And while you don't want to take it literally, take it seriously. Because what he's trying to say today is that, that there are sins, and they may not be dealing with our, our hands or our eyes or our feet, but there are certain sins that are keeping us out of the kingdom. And, and, and if, they are, if they are causing us not to enter into the fullness of life, or that it's got to be cut out. It's got to be dealt with. It's got to be at least named. And that's what we need to do today because, because I cannot remember a time in my life, and you've heard me say this before, when we have been so separated at sixes and sevens against each other when we've been so polarized and angry and so absolutist in our positions. And that's a sin. That's satanic. You know, the, the, the Pope was saying that the devil is having his day. Well, the, the diabolus, the whole purpose of, of, the, of the devil is to separate. Sin is separation. Sin is separation from, from the divine source. Sin is separation from each other that's that's what's keeping us from living so how do we how do we deal with it and of course the way we deal with it is name it and today we 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 get it named it's named pretty clearly both in the in the first reading and the second reading the sin is is named and it's a very powerful sin it's a very ugly sin in both of the readings we've got two of the favorite disciples john of jimmy and jami fame 
you know? How, how interesting. James and John wanted to sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. And there lies in the sin. Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' boy, is pretty upset. Now, what are they upset over? Now, someone's doing something that, excuse me, belongs to them. John, the disciple, comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, you, you gave us the power to cast out demons. And I saw someone, a Presbyterian, <laughs> casting out a demon. Stop him. He's not of our group. He's not one of us. He's not one of the good guys. He's not one of the, the Catholics. And of course, what's Jesus' response? Oh, cool your jets, John. If he's not against us, he's with us. No one could speak ill of the Christ and good of the Christ at the same time. And who is the Christ? The Christ is this cosmic presence of the divine flush throughout all of creation. Joshua's got the same problem. You know, the, the Spirit of God comes down upon the 70 elders and they're all on the list and, and two of them weren't, weren't there when the Spirit comes down. And so Joshua comes up to Moses and he's all, all a Twitter and all upset and he's saying, Moses, the Blues brothers, Eldad and Medad, they weren't there. And they're prophesying. And they're prophesying. And the Spirit of God has come down upon them. Stop them. Stop them. And of course, Moses' response was very interesting. He says, are you, are you jealous on my account? Don't get jealous on my account. Give me a break. And by the way, the sin isn't jealousy. It's a different sin. No, don't be jealous. Oh, would that all of the people had the Spirit of God down upon them? Would that all of the people were prophesying? Would that all of the people had the power to cast out the demons? Would that it came down upon everybody? Because that's when the kingdom comes, and that's when the divisions are broken down. That's when we have a potential for uni union. But you don't seem to want that. You know what you want? And here's the sin. What does John want? What does Joshua want? What's their sin? Power. Power. Who's got the power? Who's got the power? The almighty power of God. And Jesus pours forth the power upon the, the disciples to do what? To cast out demons. To get rid of division. To do exorcisms. And, and, and you're never going to get rid of the demon until the demon is named. So he's got the power to do that. Now, there, there are two kinds of power. There's a, a worldly power, which is a power to dominate, which is a power to be in control. You know, the bears are going to play today. Are they going to dominate? <laughs> if they've got the power. Play a power play. Now, that's when you're bigger and badder and stronger and you can just crush the opponents. Uh, the, the, uh, the other definition of power that Bob Woodward has been putting in our face for the last several weeks is, is fear. When asked, what is the source of your power? He's responded, fear. Make them afraid. And if they're really afraid, I can control them, divide and conquer. Make them hate each other. When, when Russia got involved in working on the election, what were the two things they went after? They went after the, those that are absolutists on one side and those who are absolutists on the other side and made them harder in their position because they were divided. And when you divide, now you can come in and take the spoils. That's exactly what's going on. Fear. That's not God's power. God doesn't have that power. Sorry, he doesn't have that power. That's not the power of God. The power of God is always the power to liberate, to set free, to give life, to forgive, to let go. That's the power 
that Jesus is trying to bestow upon his disciples. That's the power of God. And as I told you last week, I'm no big fan of the new translation of, of, of the Bible, but today's opening prayer, I didn't know if you heard it or not. Oh, almighty God, who pours forth your mercy. That's the power of God. The power to forgive. The power to let go. The power to heal. Now what's so ironic is that these two dodos, John and Joshua, think that they're, going to have, they're having the power of the world when what God and Jesus and Moses are trying to get them is the power of God. The power to forgive. The power to exercise the demons. And you can only exercise the demon when you can see it and name it. And of course, what's the demon? The demon is the desire to be in control. To be better than. To be superior than. To have my privilege. Rank has its privilege. To be entitled. We watched all kinds of entitlement going on this last week that's the power of the world and that's what john and joshua want and they're going no you ain't going to get it that's not it no your job is not to power over people your job is to empower people empowerment is very different from having power over empowerment is taking what is inside and letting it out liberating it Setting it free. Saying that the same stuff that's in me is now in you. You've got the power to exercise the demons. You've got the power that was been given to me, what's been given to me freely, I now give to you. I now ordain you an exorcist. Name the hurt, name the pain, name the resentment. Because what's hell? What's hell? You know, we talk about where the worm dies not and the fire is going and he's, he's describing this terrible, terrible hell. Excuse me, hell is not when you die. For a lot of people, hell's right now. Everybody in this room knows someone in hell. Filled with resentment and anger and fear. Accusations. Hatred. And it owns them. It owns them. 75, 95% of those thoughts are over and over again and feed it a little bit. And like Audrey, too, it's going to eat everything in its sight. It's going to eat you up. It's going to kill you. And it won't die. Where the worm dies not and the fire is never quenched, that's Gehenna, that's hell. And everybody at some time or another finds themselves in hell. What do you do? You get it out. How do you get it out? By being empowered. By being empowered, by taking some of that spirit and pouring it on the other. And we're called to do that. We're called to be the exorcists. You know, we're called to be the ones who go forth and use the power that has been given to you. Jesus has called each and every one of you, each and every one of us here today, and has poured his spirit upon us at the day of our baptism, at the day of our confirmation. And he says, now go forth and do what, do what I did. And that means heal the divide. And find the divine, even in your enemy, even in the one that you think you hate because the divine is in them as well. That's called empowerment. And where do you begin? Where, where you always have to begin. Never at the top. Never at the top. Always at the bottom. Oh, we, we listen to St. James' diatribe today. You rich, you wail, and you moan, and you groan, and you grieve because what you think you're going to hold on to for the rest of your life is going to rot. Your clothing is moth-eaten. Moth your gold and your silver is corroded. It, and if you think you're saving for the future, you're saving for nothing. No, though the work is to, is to, is to take care of what? The little one. A glass of cold water in my name. When, when you get it to one of these little ones because they belong to me, because their, their spirit is in my spirit and my spirit is in theirs, oh, trust me, you're not going to want for your reward. But if you cause them to sin, if you make them as bitter and angry 
as you are right now, it is better that a millstone goes around your neck and that you are cast into the sea. Those are tough words, but we got to hear them because we're all caught in the process. So what do we do? Where do we begin? How do we empower? Well, we begin empowering by allowing that Spirit of God that is in us to touch the other and giving them the respect of the divine in them. And it's happening. You know, it's as difficult and painful as things are right now. It's happening. It's happening literally to one half of the population before our very eyes. And it seems like it only began yesterday, but oh, for the last several hundred years, and, and now that it's going and growing exponentially, those who are becoming empowered with the Spirit of God that dwells in them is the whole second half of the sexes, the feminine half, empowered, empowered, like it's never been empowered before seeing its worth, speaking up for injustice, saying who they are. Empowerment. Empowerment for those who are left out, those who are outside of the borders, outside of the stream, outside, those who have been separated from their, from their children and families, to go forth and empower them. Bring them into the fold where they belong. Uh, Tom told me the other day if I get a chance to go into Chicago because the Doctors Without Borders are having a, a special exhibit. Oh, no, it's an interaction with you and, and these wonderful young people who are volunteers for Doctors Without Borders to give you an experience of what it might be like to be a refugee to be one of the little ones, to be the Anawim, the poor of God, the poor of Yahweh. And I was just so hopeful and so impressed because I was with a, a group of school children. And as we went to this, in, they showed the, the map of Africa where all the, the doctors without borders are and, 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 and throughout the world. And, and they said, point, point in, 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 in the Middle East, point to Afghanistan. And the little 10-year-olds were pointing to Afghanistan. Point to Burundi. The little one found Burundi. I couldn't find Burundi to save my life. And that's where I was from at that point. So there's, there's great hope. But it's got to begin at the beginning. And the Spirit has to be allowed to be poured out upon everyone it's not scarcity we don't have a god of scarcity it's not a zero-sum game where there's only power for me and my power is only an inverse proportion to what's for you no it's a god of abundance there's enough to go around for everyone there's enough spirit to heal the world our holy work and its work is to enter into that spirit, trust it, go with it, work with it. Oh, would that, would that, all my people were prophets, would that the spirit were to come down upon all.